quite a it's quite a rhythm. Yeah, yeah. Like every three months. Ladies and gentlemen, we move on now to our next keynote speaker. First of all, I must say I must say that that our hashtag our hashtag is actually gone past the borders of Barcelona. It's, it's created a, a mind of its own, and it's gone further than Europe. We are actually trending worldwide. Did you know that? Or do you care? Okay, never mind. Keep those, <laughs> keep those tweets coming. Keep the photographs coming as well. And sharing uh, as much buzz as we can about the event over the last three days, the insights, the, the quotes. And uh, again, as I said earlier on, a, a couple of days ago, let the people in your offices, wherever they are around the world, know how much fun and how much enjoyment you're having here in right in the center of Barcelona. Okay, we move on now, as I say, to our next keynote uh, speaker. Now, intuition is a magical thing. It's a very important thing as well. And I'm sure many of us here base our decisions quite a lot on intuition. Who bases most of their decisions on their gut feeling? Hands up, let me see. Quite a lot of you. Well, let me tell you one thing. Gentleman on stage, next on stage, he's going to tell you how wrong you are. He's going to tell you exactly how wrong you are and, and kind of make sense of, of why following your intuition to make uh, um, product decisions is probably, probably maybe not the right thing to do. It's a gentleman who actually started his career at PricewaterhouseCoopers in the public sector and then actually spent most of his career at Yahoo, where he was the senior director of entertainment and lifestyle products responsible for the music, movies, TV, celebrity, and video lifestyle sites across the globe. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together. We're very happy and delighted to have him here right on this stage uh, today at Four Years From Now, the director of product innovation for growth and acquisition at Net Netflix, Mr. Michael Spiegelman. All right, great. Thank you and welcome. That was uh, quite an introduction. Uh, so as mentioned, my name is Michael Spiegelman. I uh, lead growth and acquisition for Netflix. And I'm here to tell you about why you're wrong and probably what, to, and, and what you should do about it. Uh, I don't mean to suggest that any of you have particularly poor intuition or poor judgment. Uh, just by being here, I think you're showing exceptionally good judgment. Uh, so, but I really want to talk about you know, this at a much broader level and how it impacts our decision making and really tell you some examples from working at Netflix and how we've been wrong and what we try and do about it to correct for our own biases. So uh, just before I get started, uh, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about how I ended up at Netflix. Um, how many of you here are familiar with Netflix's Culture Deck? By a show of hands. All right, so a few of you are. Uh, so the essence of Netflix's Culture Deck is really it's a document that we published out there to talk about you know, what life is like to work in, in working at Netflix. And it's really not meant to be aspirational. It's not meant to be just glowing descriptions of who we are, but really descriptive of what, what it's actually like to be at Netflix. And the essence of it is really this notion of freedom and responsibility. So we give you the freedom to do the things that you think are in the best interest of the company. We give you a, a lot of autonomy to pursue those objectives. And then we give you the responsibility to act in Netflix's best interest. Not just the best interest of your division or your group or your team or whatever, but really the best interest of the company. So uh, several years ago, uh, before I joined Netflix, I was uh, working at, at, at Yahoo. And uh, an old boss of mine sent me this, uh, this culture deck. And he said, I think this is something you'd be interested in. So I read it. And it was really interesting. And it talks a lot about you know, our culture, as I mentioned, the, you know, the freedom of responsibility. And it also talks about sort of the high performance nature of the culture. And one of the lines in there, it says, the reward for average performance is a generous severance package. And things like that really hit me as being very descriptive of what Netflix is really looking for and, and what really kind of goes into making a high performance culture. So I read the deck, I said, this is great, you know, really interesting, uh, didn't really think anything of it, until a few months later when Netflix Recruiting called me and said, hey, we'd like you to come in and talk about this role at, at Netflix. So I was living in LA at the time, I flew up to Silicon Valley, I met with, uh, with the team there, I asked everyone about the culture, is it really like this, is that just what it really like, you know, please tell me. And they said, yeah, it's about 95% uh, true. So I flew back down to LA, you know, kind of thought about the decision. Uh, but really, you know, having been at big companies, I wanted to look for something smaller, you know, a startup, and I had some other positions that were, that were possibilities there. Um, so, uh, you know, I was kind of thinking I'd go in that direction. Uh, then Netflix Recruiting called me again, 
And they said, listen, Reed Hastings is gonna be down in, in LA for a conference, would you wanna have dinner with him? And so I said, yeah, I could probably make that work. You know, I could probably like shift around that happy hour I was going to or whatever else was gonna be in my, uh, in my calendar and meet with Reed. And so we had met at this, this restaurant in LA in Redondo Beach and Reed said, okay, so what's your decision making? You know, what, what are you thinking about? So I told him and he said, well, what, what makes you really wanna work at a small company? Why is that important? And I said, well, I've worked at big companies for a while and you know, I really wanna have my decision stick. You know, when I decide something, you know, I really wanna be able to pursue that and not have corporate strategy changes or changes of executive, the kind of things that go on a lot. And he said, uh, listen, my job at Netflix as the CEO is to make this a kind of company where you don't need to be a top, top executive to make the decisions. You'll come in here, you'll have autonomy. And he said, you'll present to me for feedback, but never for approval. And that was the line that really got me to, to join Netflix. This whole notion that um, even coming from the CEO, it was really all about you, know, you making your decisions, you, making have, uh, you having autonomy, and you making the best decisions for the company. So that brings us to uh, the beginning, which is really talking about life and product management at Netflix. And really the essence of it is experimentation. Um, and the idea is we try and really apply sort of the notions of uh, scientific method to product development in that in every, for every uh, you know, thing we want to do to benefit customers, we have a hypothesis about what this would, would is and how it would benefit our customers. And then we seek to measure that in the most sort of scientific way possible and use the most amount of data to inform our decision making. Um, and the core thing about having a hypothesis is you're actually trying to prove that hypothesis wrong. So you've got this great idea, this big idea, this thing that you think is gonna make like customers experience so much better, and it's your job to really look at all the data, look at the testing, and employ all, to all your tools to pound away at this thing and see if you're actually right, and to prove yourself wrong before you can guarantee that you're right. And I think that notion is really, really important, and it's really kind of the essence of what we're doing is, we see ourselves as people who are really trying to make the customer experience good and hold ourselves to such a high standards that we wanna make sure that when we do it, it's right. So the fundamental uh, tool that we use the most is A-B testing, and how many people here are familiar with A-B testing? By a show of hands. All right, a good number. So uh, the essence of it is really you, you do a, a randomized controlled experiment where people come into your service are allocated at different cells of an experience, and you see how they react, and you look at the behavior metrics, and you see which one moves those metrics in a more positive direction. Now, uh, many of you have, you know, are, are starting to get smaller startups. You may not have the scale to start doing A-B testing immediately, but one of my recommendations is to really see how you can build a culture of experimentation as soon as possible. Um, and that is really sort of the crucial element, to see how you can test and see how you can learn, and then scale your way up to larger scale A-B testing as you grow. But if you have that notion of experimentation from the very beginning, it'll really help you. Uh, I was talking a few years ago to uh, one of my colleagues at, at Netflix who was there since like the early days, like really you know, a few years after the founding of the company, and they used to go into malls with you know, like paper prototypes that we want to build and try and get random people to look at it and give them feedback. So like that was how sort of low tech and low fi it is. And now you know, we can do a lot more. We have a lot more scale to, to do a lot more testing and have a lot sort of uh, you know, uh, grander ways of working. But it's really starting from that very core. Like Netflix started A-B testing, I think about 17 years ago uh, when it was small and still embryonic. And so when you build those capabilities over time, they're incredibly helpful. Um, but back to sort of uh, my story. So uh, when I, after I joined Netflix and with those words of Reed's uh, kind of ringing in my ears, um, one of my first projects was really to tackle our member website experience. And this is the website that you see when you come as, you know, as a registered Netflix member. Um, at the time, we kind of had our roots in like a DVD by mail business. So a lot of our site was geared around you know, uh, really researching movies, adding them to your queue, getting them delivered in the mail. Uh, that, was, that was kind of the system. What we wanted to do is really make it more about streaming. And so I kind of did this whole redesign of it and it was like larger box art, um, you know, easier access to play, less information and, and quicker access to the streams, you know, a whole bunch of changes. And I was like, this is great, you know, I have the autonomy to make decisions, like I have this responsibility, I'm gonna do this. And I brought this into a session that we call product strategy. And this is like a weekly meeting that we have of Netflix of all our product managers, design leaders, and engineering leaders. And whenever you bring an idea there, which you do you know, every time you have something you wanna test, people there kind of beat up the idea. And not really to, you know, to, um, to challenge you, but to really challenge the idea and make it better. 
so I brought my idea to this product strategy session. It looks like this kind of arena, which is a pretty good metaphor for the gladiatorial combat that ensues. And uh, this whole debate broke out. And like one of the very senior product people, uh, this guy Todd, who is now my boss, wasn't then, he went on the attack and it, the room divided into two camps. They were battling out over like whether it's a good idea or not. And one side, this is great. The other side, this is ruined personalization. And at the end, I thought like, my God, this is a disaster. Like what a poor meeting. Like everything I've learned about running meetings would say this is terrible. You know, I didn't prepare this in advance. I didn't set people up. And so I was like, oh my God, am I gonna be on the receiving end of that sort of generous severance package um, and be walking out of here? Uh, and a few hours later, I ran into my boss and he said, Michael, what a great meeting. That was fantastic. What an amazing debate. What are you gonna do now? And so that's really what kind of struck me as being most different was this notion of really finding divergent viewpoints, encouraging the debate, encouraging you know, the really impassioned um, you know, argument around it, and using that to tease things out. And because of the feedback I got, it got to be a much better product. So uh, we ended up testing that new site, rolled it out, and then a few years later, I started my current role where I'm responsible for um, acquisition, so how do we convert people to becoming paying members of Netflix? And uh, we have, we, at Netflix, we had this uh, closed site experience, uh, which means that when you come to Netflix, if you are not a registered member, you have to sign up and you have to give us a payment method um, before you're allowed to view our content and before you're allowed to view our catalog. And so, you know, I said, well, wait a minute, like, we have this great service, we have all this great content, let's show it to people. And in fact, when we did consumer research, that was like the number one thing that people asked for. They said, you know, I really wanna see the movies and TV shows before I sign up for the service. Like, how could you ask me to give you, my, give you my credit card if I don't know what I'm getting? And so we really took this consumer research to heart. Like, we listen to our customers, we're a consumer-focused company, um, let's try it out. So we built this service that allowed you to browse through the catalog and, and, uh, and find things before you joined. And then if you tried to play, you, we would, that's when we would ask you for your credit card. So we took huge amounts of friction out of the beginning part. So I was so excited about this that we tested it five times, and five times it lost. Um, which is sort of a huge blow to your ego when you ha think you have this amazing idea, and you keep testing it, and it keeps losing. Uh, and the reason why I think it kept losing is, uh, number one, you got a lot of very uncommitted people. Um, number two, you got a lot of people who kind of got lost in the content. So you would come in, you would see all this content, you would not really know exactly what it is that you want, you'd spend your time browsing through, we couldn't really personalize because you weren't playing things, and then you wouldn't find what you needed and you'd leave. And then the final thing is, you know, when you were, if you did find what you wanted, and you were like, this is amazing, great, I'm gonna go play this, then we ask for your credit card. And that just seems like a very, like, unexciting thing, right? You've gotten all excited about this content, you wanna play it, and then here's like, entering your credit card. And so these are all the reasons why I think it, it didn't work. Uh, but the important part of it is it's really kind of that, you know, that rigorous testing that, you know, that, that made us understand why this isn't working. So then we went the opposite direction. And we said, well, we're producing all this great original content. Let's just highlight the best stuff. So when you're coming to Netflix and we're launching House of Cards season three, let's talk about House of Cards. We're launching Marco Polo, let's talk about Marco Polo. We're talking about Orange New Black, let's, let's, let's show you Orange New Black. And we tried that, and so we had these great experiences, glossy experiences, we tried various kinds of video in motion, all that failed too. And I think these failed again because uh, if you heard about Orange New Black in the news, and like we were playing, you know, we, we had the show, and you came to our service, and then we told you, hey, we have Orange New Black, your thought is, yeah, I knew that. And so it's really, again, the kind of rigorous testing that brought us to these conclusions. And uh, finally, we kind of landed on the sort of Goldilocks of this, which is the just right amount of content to be able to show people. So we still have a very close site experience where you have to register and sign up, but we kind of give you a taste of the content before you join us. Um, what that, that has all led us to is uh, what we call understanding consumer science. And consumer science is a term at Netflix essentially for, you know, how do we understand the human psychology of our customers, but also uh, how do we understand the human psychology of ourselves? Uh, and there's a book that we read as the product management team, which is called Thinking Fast and Slow. Uh, show of hands, how many people read this book? Okay, cool. All right, so some here and there. Uh, so the author, Daniel Kahneman, uh, he won the Nobel Prize in Economics for applying behavior psychology to economics. 
And essentially before this, like economics always rested on this rational actor notion that you were sort of a human computer, you knew exactly what you wanted, you went and made really rational, smart decisions to get there. And anyone who deals with human beings knows that that is not always the case. And so what Kahneman did his research on was finding that, you know, all these kind of, you know, biases that underlie our decisions. And the reason he says that it happens is because the human brain works on two different levels. Uh, one is processing information coming in from all around you. It's kind of the instinctive part of the brain. And it's really geared to help you with survival. You know, it's looking for like predators on the horizon, for a food source, for danger coming, you know, all those kind of things. And there's a higher level part that's really good at cognition and analytics. And it can be invoked to help you to solve problems, but it takes a lot of energy. And what also happens that's even more important is that when it works, it works on the basis of all those biases you already have. So everything you've already internalized, everything you've already believed, all those things that you've, that you've seen on day to day, things that people have said that you've kind of taken for granted, your brain does all its amazing, brilliant, incredible processing on top of all that layers of biases. Which means there's a ton of biases. Uh, and probably a lot of you are familiar uh, with confirmation bias that is one of the sort of good example of that, one of the most powerful. And what it essentially says is that uh, when you receive information that confirms your, your existing viewpoint, you tend to believe it. And when you receive information that tends to contradict your current viewpoint, you tend to disbelieve it and, and toss it away. And we all do this. So you can see this in a lot of different places. My own home country, the United States, you can see this in our political system. Uh, things that people already believe, they will tend to believe even more so. And this happens to us when making decisions about, uh, about products. So you could see this in my own behavior where, you know, I would test these things again and again. It's like, this has to work. This is such a good idea. And every time you would get, you know, consumer research or something that, that supported it, it's like, oh, of course this is going to work. Um, and so you kind of believe the things that, that, that really do support this notion that give you kind of the credibility for, that give you kind of the, the ability to believe what you're, what you're believing. And so much of what we do is to really try and crack that. Uh, so to distill down a few of the things that, that we've learned, um, one is always to observe what people do, uh, not what they say. So people will tell you a lot about their behavior. Uh, if you do consumer research, like five minutes after someone performs an action, they will rationalize that and tell you all the reasons why they like ran all the numbers and did everything you know, according to plan, and that was always what they intended to do. But really, if you talk to them during the time and the moment, you see what people are actually thinking and what, their, what biases are underlying them. Um, and even more so, you know, looking at the metrics and looking at the data gives you the important clues about consumer behavior and shows you what they're actually doing as opposed to what they say they're going to do. Um, seeking out divergent viewpoints, uh, extremely important. So our product strategy sessions are kind of our main way of doing it. You know, we encourage that debate. We encourage dissension. We often call upon people who disagree with fundamentally with, with what I'm proposing. Um, as a way of just getting out what's the richest conversation and the biggest dialogue you can have. Now, a lot of you are at startups, and I think in very early stage startups, this is really easy to do. You know, it's easy to foster discussion, it's easy to foster dissent. Um, you ha often have, you know, co-founders, early employees will help you to do this. But this is one of those things that you want to keep doing as you grow, because essentially, you know, once you start, you know, once you start growing, you become kind of the mythical founder, or whatever it is, or the CEO. And people will start to not challenge your viewpoints enough, but you want to make sure there are a ton of, of, of divergent viewpoints. And at Netflix, even if you're someone senior, even if you're Reed Hastings, if you say something and we disagree, it's your job to say that you disagree and why, and to debate it out to get to what's the, really the best idea, um, and not just sort of take it for granted that, uh, that, 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 you know, that people know what they're talking about. Um, and finally, staying focused on your metrics. So uh, one of the most important things here is to really have metrics <clears throat> that actually really impact your business. Uh, it can be very easy to get caught up on what we call vanity metrics, which are like things that make it look good and things that support whatever it is the idea that people are talking about. But if you really focus on what the core metrics are and the things that actually impact your customers and your business and stay focused on them over the long term, <clears throat> that'll really help you. Excuse me. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, anyway, so at Netflix, we use acquisition and retention. So is this causing people to join the service, or is this causing people to stay with the service longer? And so those are really the core metrics that underlie our business, and that's what we stay focused on, and that's what we measure all our A-B tests on. Uh, so finally, I want to talk a little bit about big bets. Um, and big bets are things where, you know, it's not just like the day-to-day -day product development where you can easily 
uh, measure it through A-B testing. And I'm sure you know, many of you who work at startups are taking big bets all the time. And you don't have the luxury of testing everything. You don't have the luxury of, of sort of uh, precisely measuring everything, so you have to take some bets. And that happens at Netflix, too. So one of our major bets uh, was going global. So when I started at Netflix, we were just in the US. This was six years ago. And we first launched <coughs> in Canada. And when we launched in Canada, it was like, oh my god, can we make this successful in Canada? It's so much different from the US. It's so far north. It's colder. Um, and it was really when we got the proof point back from us working at Netflix that we got confident that this would work uh, outside the United States. And then we went to Latin America. And this really challenged us quite a lot. And we made a lot of mistakes and had to learn a lot. A lot about payments, a lot about local marketing, a lot about finding the right local content, things like that. And so each of these things along the way, you know, even though you kind of see these big bets around entire markets, there were really a series of bets that we took and a series of things that we hypothesized, many of which were wrong in the beginning. In Latin America, we thought that telenovelas would be big. They weren't. Things like that. So we had to find our way through testing our way into a lot of things to help learn these markets. And that really gave us the confidence to really go fully global. Um, and you know, a little over a year ago, we launched in 130 countries. We're now in 190 countries around the world. Um, but it was really these series of small bets that helped to make that pay off. Uh, original content is, is very similar. So um, if you look at our, our original content now, a lot of you may be familiar with House of Cards, with Orange is the New Black. Uh, but at the time, you know, when we launched these, we didn't know that a series that was based on kind of a remake of parliamentary British intrigue uh, would do well. We didn't know that a show about people in prison, which featured no really well-known actors and actresses, would do well. And there were other shows that we launched that you know, were much smaller, much more niche, and didn't explode the same way that, that the larger ones did. Uh, but each of these was a series of bets where we learned more about our audience, we learned about what people wanted, um, and we got to sort of double down on the things that worked. Uh, so finally, uh, I'd be remiss if I did not talk about uh, one of our biggest mistakes, which is uh, about five or six years ago, uh, we decided to split our DVD and streaming businesses. So our origins were, were DVDs. We then launched a streaming service. They have very fundamental different economics. They had you know, a lot of, they had overlapping but somewhat different user bases. And, um, and so we decided to split it into separate streaming and DVD offerings. Uh, with, you know, with kind of a price hike that accompanied this because we were sort of now charging for both services. And customers hated it. Like, we lost hundreds of thousands of subscribers. The press was, you know, went on the attack. Um, I mean, things just looked really, really disastrous. Uh, and if you look at it from a business performance standpoint, you know, that was kind of our stock price up till then. And that's what happened afterwards. So we lost, you know, probably 80% of our market value within a matter of a few months. And if you were within Netflix, it looked like, oh my God, like this is gonna be the end. You know, I uh, had a conversation with a journalist who joined us as part of, uh, of our PR team, and he said, listen, the only reason that I think that you guys didn't get, uh, didn't get acquired then was because no one thought you'd last a year. Um, so that looked really bad and was a result of, you know, of a large bet that did not work out. Uh, but internally, we stayed really focused on, you know, we could have panicked, we could have stopped a lot of things, but we stayed focused on, on global expansion. We stayed focused on um, starting to think through and, and come up with our original content strategy, and even more so on just kind of the day-to-day -day basis of, of A-B testing and improving the experience. And then if you step back, um, you know, that's what the business performance has, been, has looked like uh, over the long term. Um, and so my point here really is that if you're just in the middle of that part there, like, things look terrible. Uh, but, and you really can get caught up in the day-to-day, -day, especially around what people are saying. But for us, the fundamental was we had a product that people wanted, and we were offering a, a value, you know, a price at value, and that was sort of the fundamental that carried through us, as well as sort of focusing on again and again, you know, how we're going to make a good customer experience. Um, and really, the the kind of argument for this uh, is, really, I think Jeff Bezos said it very well. Um, you know, often considered a uh, a competitor of ours, but we collaborate many things, and I think we have you know a lot of the same approaches. And he said, if you have, you know, given a 10% chance of 100 times payoff, you should take that bet every time. Um, and sort of the fundamental is, you are not going to be right all the time. You're not even going to write most of the time. When we do A-B testing, with all the assembled expertise of Netflix's product team, design team, engineering team, people have been doing this for years, we're still wrong more than half the time. And so you're going to be wrong more than half the time, and that is okay. 
Um, but you really want to think about like what are the economics of the bets that you're taking, and how do you take the bets that are really going to pay off in a very large way? Because that's what really, you know, that's what really sort of moves the needle, and that's what really sort of moves the, the business is not being right all the time. Um, you can educate yourself, you can you can give yourselves better chances to be right, um, but it's really being able to measure what happens when you're right or wrong, taking those bets, and then um, at, you know, and then when you uh, when you have one that succeeds, really looking at how much that pays off. So. Um, that's, uh, that, that's my talk for today. Uh, I think we'll have a few minutes for, uh, for Q&A if we have questions for the audience. And I would be remiss if I didn't say that we are hiring. Uh, in fact, I myself am hiring, so if you are uh, looking to join a company that still has a lot of great uh, culture, a lot of great huge value, um, I think is making huge impact, then please come find me and let's talk. So thank you. All right, should we do some Q&A? Who has questions? Um, I was going to ask, how do you break down your product management teams? Is it done by geography or by mobile desktop? So, so is the question, are our product management teams broken down geographically or by platform area? So um, they're broken down uh, by platform area, not geography. So all our span is global. Uh, the Netflix product team is actually quite small. It's around 15 or 16 people out of a product development organization of maybe 1,500. And, but we have global responsibilities. The idea is to really keep everyone focused on what are we doing for customers around the world, not just customers in the US or not just customers in, in Europe, but how does what we do affect everybody? Other questions? At some point, you had an API to do things uh, on top of Netflix, and then you closed it. You, do you uh, think you're going to open the platform to uh, external uh, options? Uh, we, we do a very nice language learning based on uh, watching videos. Uh, so if the, if the question was, uh, why did we shut down our, our open access APIs? Um, really, it was that uh, we found a lot of people who were doing things that violated terms of service, and there were a bunch of things that were not terribly interesting. So it's now really on a partner relationship basis. So if you have a, a good idea, um, you can come talk to me and I'll route you appropriately. But we really try and focus on, you know, on what are the great ideas that we want to empower um, and not you know, uh, make things so open that there are kind of abuses that happen. Uh, maybe one final question. Hi, here in the middle. Uh, so you've been talking a lot about uh, how you use metrics to guide the way you're building the product, and you're talking about the big bets. How do you avoid getting into kind of the rabbit hole of just optimization and kind of deviating from the vision of where you want to take the product? Yeah, great. So the question was, um, how do we sort of make ourselves not get into the habit of just, uh, just optimizing things again and again? Um, that's a really good question, uh, and it's something I had sort of thought about talking about explicitly in, in the talk, but I'm glad you brought it up. Um, so what we do is we have a concept called mountain testing, and the idea comes from uh, this notion of a local maximum. So the pr one of the problems in A-B testing is, is you can get to a local maximum, which means you've tested your way into like the best possible incarnation of that feature. And when you keep testing, you're just getting like very, very small, you know, uh, kind of very small optimizations and small wins on top of that. So what we do is that every so often we take a big swing at redes completely redesigning the experience. Um, and we call it a mountain test because we're trying to get from the local max maximum to another mountain test elsewhere. Uh, it's a very useful technique uh, because most times in A-B testing you're controlling for every variable and looking to make sure that everything um, is, is carefully separated. Here you just take one kind of giant swing at it, maybe separate a few different variables, but have a very fundamentally different approach to it. Um, when you asked about our kind of geography orientation versus platform orientation, we're much more oriented on a platform basis. So we have product managers who will own, you know, Netflix on connected televisions or Netflix on mobile. Um, and what they'll do is they'll say, okay, let's take a huge new idea for, uh, for Netflix on TV or Netflix on the mobile device. Let's, re let's design that. Let's build an, an iteration of that. And let's test that versus our current experience. 
and then we see which one wins and see which one moves our core metrics the best. Um, but that's kind of our way of controlling for, you know, for these local maximums. Uh, and I think like a good part of what we do is we try not to make A-B testing just about, you know, have we changed the colors or have we changed the wording, you know, although a lot of the, the you know, kind of optimization of messaging is important, but really make it about a fundamental tool for everything that we want to do. And so probably 95% of what we do in the product organization is an A-B test, whether it's new features, whether it's, you know, refinement of ex existing features, or whether it's a whole new take on, you know, on our website or on our connected television or things like that. Um, and I think that's like a very important part of keeping us moving. All right, thank you everyone. <laughs>